I'd like to go on to the second presentation. Firstly, I'd like to thank um, Paul for uh, um, Paul for actually honouring my request this morning to give a his poster presentation into oral presentation, and also for Carl Cock in um, helping get this presentation together. So Paul will be talking about um, seismic evidence supporting the occurrence of the May 2010 event. Thank you. So thank you, David, uh, for the invitation. Um, received at short notice. I, I'm not sure if he's doing me or any of you a favor. Uh, um, we'll see. <laughs> so uh, could you please show the title of this talk, back one? Would you go? Oh, I can go back. Huh? So this is the title. Um, and uh, essentially what um, I have done with the help of a colleague, uh, Carl Koch, who's sitting in the front row here, um, we both have posters. Uh, T2.2, number 9, is mine. And uh, number 14 is his. And so in the last hour or so, we have been extracting bits and pieces of our poster at, at David's request. So the story for me began three years ago when I received notification that a very distinguished uh, senior Swedish uh, radio chemist analyst was about to publish an extraordinarily strongly worded claim that from four stations uh, more or less around the Korean peninsula were observed some remarkably anomalous recordings uh, of xenons, plural, different uh, isotopes, and uh, bar uh, barium-140, lanthanum-140. So the stations we're talking about are crudely, as seen here, you may imagine from space. Um, imagine they are high above uh, to the northwest of the Korean peninsula that you're looking toward the southeast, and you see there uh, the radio nuclide stations that were receiving anomalous signals recorded in the month of May 2010. Um, and I, I won't give a lot of detail, but those interested, uh, I'm sure, have seen um, these numbers. So at the different stations uh, are described here the reports of different radio xenon isotopes uh, and associated in the paper with the strong claim that there must have been some type of perhaps small uh, nuclear test on certain specific days in either April or May of 2010. So let us now move to the story, if I may, of my own speciality, which is seismology. And I'll be referring to this map a few times in this presentation. And you see that star in the north, uh, eastern part of North Korea, uh, from which we have now experienced the uh, signals of three definitely nuclear tests. And to the north and somewhat to the west and a little bit to the east, a variety of different colored stations that have operated at different times in China. And so we'll be describing them. First, going back to May 2010, the time of observed anomalous radionuclide observations, um, I have some considerable familiarity. Uh, do I have a pointer? Well, I, uh, um, you, you'll see that green triangle to the top, Station Mudanjiang in Manchuria, uh, which my colleague Won Yong Kim and I have used in several publications, reporting in some detail the signals uh, as we interpreted them of um, a variety of seismic sources in that part of the world, including the nuclear explosions of North Korea. So our first effort was to search on the putative dates of uh, Lars Eric de Geer's uh, reports to see if we could find any signals. Now, uh, his claim was that something on the order of perhaps 50 tons uh, might have been uh, exploded uh, in, in North Korea. So we searched for those five days and found no seismic evidence and the context here is one in which, with our experience from this MDJ station, here are a series of really quite good quality recordings that that same station made in 1998 
uh, showing very good seismograms, both P waves and, and, and uh, LG, a type of shear wave, from known one or two ton chemical explosions executed just north of the border with North Korea in China as part of a classical Pascal type refraction survey. So these are known chemical explosions of interest both for their P to S spectral ratio and the fact that they're so easily detectable uh, at this incredibly small size of 0 0.001 kilotons. Yeah, it's very, uh, so it's a good station. And our search failed. When we looked for those five days in May 2010, but it allowed us to put some kind of statement out that um, if anything had happened at the claimed time from the radionuclide uh, indications, uh, what might have been there would be not above magnitude two, perhaps something in the order of one and a half to two. Uh, we would still kind of expect it, but um, anything below one and a half, we, we probably wouldn't be able to see uh, reliably at MDJ. So the first effort failed. But then let me move on to uh, something that has spurred a lot of work in, in uh, the last uh, six months or so. Uh, in about October last year, I heard from colleagues that um, an interesting manuscript was in circulation being considered for publication and it was eventually published with this title that really gets attention uh, because again in strong language uh, as Lars Eric de Geer had used from radionuclides but now on the seismic side saying there was something. Actually it wasn't quite in that five day period we had studied and failed to find anything. It was nine minutes later. Uh, in universal time, nine minutes into the date of May 12, 2010, claimed by a graduate student, Miao Zhang, and his advisor, who has an appointment both in China and is a senior professor also in the State University of New York at Stony Brook, uh, Lian Qingwen, uh, a very, very good analyst with a lot of excellent papers to his credit, a very serious uh, analyst. And uh, they make this strong statement. So uh, <clears throat> let me now go back to look. I, I, will, I will give their evidence uh, uh, shortly, but I, they have a very specific time, nine minutes into the day of May 12. And they say that something happened about magnitude 1.5. Well, why hadn't we seen it uh, uh, at a station Mudanjiang. Well, here's the answer to that question, because you are seeing here in blue the three component record, vertical and the two horizontal components, from the known nuclear explosion of May 2009, exactly aligned with where you would expect to see signals from now a claimed um, explosion, uh, very small perhaps, but uh, the claim is that something happened on May 12. Uh, very near the North Korean test site, interpreted by certain um, papers, as I've just described, as being perhaps a well, strongly worded statement saying that it uh, claimed to be a, a small uh, nuclear explosion. And when you see this alignment, uh, you actually uh, don't uh, see anything at the MDJ station because, coincidentally, it turns out there is something else happening there. Uh, you see in red, um, a station that, that would be able to detect uh, normally uh, something at that magnitude level but is at that time happening to receive uh, something which I would characterize this as an LG wave. Moving on, uh, let me try to uh, do justice. I can't do it in the available time but at least convey to you uh, again the basis for the claim by Zhang and Wen. Again, you see in that star the North Korean test site. And you also see in these circles, the smaller one of radius 100 and the larger one, um, 200, inside which are shown, I uh, count them, I think six stations less than 200 kilometers from the North Korean test site. So Zhang and Wen um, used this data uh, using a sophisticated cross-correlation method in which they have access to signals from previous nuclear tests and, and uh, subsequent nuclear tests, of course, in, in 2013. 
and carefully stacked uh, corollograms with the right delay. They chose lots of different candidate locations and, and found a location about a kilometer or so, uh, roughly southwest of the 2009 known nuclear explosion, uh, which they offer as the candidate for a location for what they detect as the claimed about magnitude 1.5 signal, for which they also show uh, this um, usually rather good um, discriminant in which you take the spectral ratio of the P waves and divide it by the spectral ratio of uh, a type of shear wave called LG. At different frequencies in black, you see what that ratio is for what are thought to be earthquakes. The top two traces in red are from the uh, nuclear explosions of two, uh, uh, two, uh, 2009 and 2013. And in the middle, as you see it here, uh, the um, event they certainly have detected, and it lies somewhat between the earthquake population and the explosion population, and they've colored it red, and they unambiguously assert that this is a small nuclear test. So their data um, is not available to me. I, I've uh, asked both authors. They uh, came to the American Geophysical Union meeting last December in San Francisco, and several of us um, seismologists spoke with several hours with them. We're very interested and got all sorts of details about their methods. But uh, although they would have loved to have provided us with the data that they had analyzed, they were not uh, able to do that, unfortunately. But uh, their claim, of course, set off a, a, a vigorous search for evidence uh, from alternative sources on the seismic side. And that's what this map also shows. So you see yellow triangles here. There's a wonderful uh, acronym, NECESSARE. Uh, it's, uh, it's the Northeast China uh, type of array uh, stations. They're temporary stations shown with these yellow triangles. And it turns out that this data is openly available to anybody in the world, including all the people in this room, if you make a request to the IRIS Data Management Center. And you will see the first confirming evidence of a seismic event at the claimed time and place. If you look at the signals from station, the best one is NE3C, which my colleague Carl Koch has analyzed in some good detail. And then a few weeks ago, uh, I should have done this uh, earlier, but I remembered. Um, in the 1970s, I had a graduate student. His name is Kinyip Chun. Uh, he eventually got a PhD in Berkeley. Uh, but 40 years ago, he worked with me, and I remembered that in June of 2004, he put a string of uh, more than 10 stations in China, very high quality uh, equipment, uh, just north of the border with North Korea, and those are the stations you see here in red, and I know them as the Dong Bay um, uh, Seismographic Broadband Network. And uh, I, I was able to receive data from the Time period. So I wrote to, her, to my uh, former student, uh, Kin Yip, he's, he's now retired and living in Shanghai, and, uh, and asked if the data might be available. And within a week or two, uh, we had received uh, the data from May 2010. And also, uh, unlike the necessary array data, uh, we were able to get the template waveforms at these same stations from the two nuclear tests 2006 to 2009, most definitely recorded by this network, which unfortunately was pulled out before 2013. But it did operate for on the order of, uh, I think it was six or seven years before it was moved. And so we'll look at that data shortly again. So first of all, the yellow station, NE3C. Carl Koch, sitting here in the front row on my left and your right, um, just uh, looked as you see them here, you see some green lettering on the bottom left. That's the three different channels of the NE3C station. And looking at the P wave time window, you can do a particle motion analysis with a three component record. And that's what you see in these wiggly red lines. And, and when you see that type of particle motion for the arriving P wave, it points uh, to the direction from whence the source. Uh, presumably uh, must have 
been, and it, it, that is a, a direction pointing to the North Korea test site. So this is a confirmation from an open station. Uh, here is the Dongbei network. Uh, and again from Carl Koch, this is uh, uh, an illustration of the type of data quality that that network exhibits for May 2010. Um, my own colleague uh, who worked in detail on this, uh, two people at Lamont, uh, Columbia University, Won Young Kim, uh, has shown here again with the Dongbei signals the record section um, uh, for the uh, clearest stations. And most usefully, perhaps, of all, uh, in red are shown the best quality Dongbei records for vertical components. And very interestingly, in blue, the horizontal components. And you see at these best stations some really quite strong LG waves, uh, which is not particularly diagnostic of an explosion. But uh, so that's what we have. That's uh, good data, and we're still analyzing it. And because this network was in place for several years, uh, I am quite sure that it recorded uh, a number of earthquakes that uh, we can perhaps uh, expect to uh, make further detailed progress. So this is uh, what we have. It's time for me to make some concluding remarks. Um, from open source seismic data um, from the Nexus Array Network and additional regional data that we acquired uh, about a month or two ago, from the Dongbei Seismographic Network uh, support indeed a seismic event on 12 May on or near the North Korea test site and it's very, very small. The small nuclear explosion of 2006 was approximately magnitude 4. So that arithmetic tells you that there's a magnitude 2.5 difference. To remind you that's a logarithmic scale so that magnitude two and a half translates to a factor of 300 times smaller signals from this ridiculously small event that we're spending so much time on. Right? So uh, that's important to me to make the point that uh, a variety of different monitoring networks are in place and do their work so well that we're spending our time on these amazingly small events. This is a comprehensive test ban treaty. We wish to do a perfect job of verification. Well, we do a pretty good job. There will always be something as you get towards zero where there will be something you're not quite sure of. But my larger point is to say get away from a lot of the details and remember we can monitor down to really, really small size. And if the other thing that is problematic, it's because it's just incredibly small. Um, so I didn't have time to describe the details, but because we have templates from previous explosions at the Dongbei network, we, uh, in the hands of my capable colleague David Schaff, have been able to apply modern methods of cross-correlation to LG signals, and his best assessments of the relative location is somewhat different from that of Zhang and Wen. He would place it a few kilometers to the southwest of the 2009 known nuclear explosion. He gave me a number. He said it's on the order of five kilometers to the southwest with an uncertainty on the order of three kilometers. So it's a little bit further in his opinion from, um, from the nine, 2009 event. Uh, and uh, there's uh, another paper been published in, in, in uh, recent um, uh, months, uh, for, uh, Sean Ford and, and uh, Bill Walter, who have failed to get a detection with sophisticated methods of analysis applied to the IMS array in Usurisk. Um, and, um, but I think that is explained if the event of current interest, 12 May, uh, is not all that close to the 2009 event. That would mean that the waveforms would be perhaps sufficiently different that using cross-correlation as a detector wouldn't be quite as good as it would be if the events were truly coincident. So uh, looking ahead, uh, there are, I think, on the order of five earthquakes within 100 kilometers from the North Korean test site for which I have high prospects of being able to uh, get data access. And with application of attenuation maps, the key thing is to uh, resolve objectively by seismic means, that's the only technology I know, uh, whether this event was an earthquake or an explosion. Uh, 
and it appears that that type of study may be possible. So uh, this is my final graphic, and this is the main finding, that uh, extensive efforts are showing that ultra-small events can be analyzed using multiple technologies, and that we are dealing with signals hundreds of times smaller than the known small event of 2006. Uh, thank you again, Paul, for giving this uh, presentation. Any questions? There will be time to obviously interrogate Paul at his poster uh, later on this, this afternoon. This is a long ad for posters number 9 and number 14 in the yes. T2.2 section. And um, Paul, I have one question uh, for you. In terms of the data set that you got from your Chinese colleague, would that be available to anyone else to use to make their own yeah, okay. decisions? So, uh, uh, Ken Yip Chun, I think he is a Canadian citizen, so I would characterize him as a Chinese Canadian, uh, uh, currently living in Shanghai. But most of his professional career, he worked in the University of Toronto. And I uh, appreciated him sending me the data, and I sent him a question. I said, uh, Ken Yip, if somebody asks me for this data, what do you advise me to say? And he said, that's fine, you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, so if somebody makes a request, uh, I will be guided by his instruction. I asked him, what should I do if somebody asks me for this data? And he said, you can do what you want with it. So I, I, I didn't want to say it's open data. I don't have a great facility such as the Irish community does for distributing data. Uh, so I, it's not open in that sense, but it's most certainly not closed. And if I... Yeah, I, so I, I don't have a lot of time to distribute data, but uh, I would imagine uh, that can be made available to anybody who wants to do serious analysis with it. Thank you. Um, we're now back on track, so he filled the gap very nicely there with a fantastic presentation.